Hi everybody, my name is Connie Silvernagel. Uh, I am a research scientist here at Hub SeaWorld Research Institute. And how I got started in all this was basically going to school uh, to get an undergraduate in cell and molecular biology. And then from there, went to veterinary school at Ross University. And then from there, I worked in private practice for a little while with both domestic and some wildlife species. And then uh, went back to school to get a master's in epidemiology from UC Davis. And uh, what that means is studying disease at the population level for animals, and then implications of disease, how it spreads from uh, animals to humans, so how it relates to public health. And then from there, after a few years practicing here at Hubs, um, I got diplomate status with the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine, which just basically says that you're a specialist in your field. Um, but as I started at Hubs, I actually started as a postdoc research associate. So right after finishing my master's degree, um, I was here and, and at Hubs basically was my primary responsibility was taking care of our fish as part of our aquaculture program. So more or less as a clinical veterinarian, but also did separate research projects on the side studying wild fish disease or even working with some of our other scientists across the country um, doing data analysis for wild mammal populations and disease associated with them. So yeah, now I, it took a few years, but uh, I've moved up through the ranks and have been working as a research scientist. So uh, today I will primarily talk to you about uh, my work related with the aquaculture program. Today we are at our Carlsbad hatchery. It's located in Carlsbad, California, but we do have two locations on the California West Coast in Carlsbad and then our headquarters in Mission Bay. So I kind of split my time between the two. And this is the general purpose laboratory. So we will do everything from small fish necropsy workups to nutrition um, trials in here. We have different equipment. Uh, we prep um, different vitamins and or um, water quality um, additives that we need to add to some of our brood stock tanks. And then we also have, do a full suite of water quality analysis on the other side of the laboratory. And then behind me, we'll see an ultra low um, freezer and that's for freezing sensitive samples that you can later work up. Often it's DNA types of analysis. Anything you're working on right now? Sure, lots of different projects. <laughs> um, just finished up a, a wild fish disease survey here in California specific to wild white sea bass. Um, so hoping to get that publication out soon. And um, kind of working with some of our other scientists. I do a lot of other like associated or affiliated research work. So we have some nutrition work that's recently been done. And I was pulled in to help with some of the histology of of the liver, looking at the livers of fish and how it they may have changed after a certain feeding regime. Pardon me, what is histology? What is histology? So it's looking at tissues like internal organs, so liver, kidney, things like that, um, at a microscopic level. So you cut really thin slices of tissue after they have been embedded in basically a, a wax type block. And you, you do very thin slices and then you mount that on a slide and you look at it under a microscope. So we typically have the whole mounting, the, the slicing and mounting procedure done by an outside diagnostic laboratory. And then we also work with pathologists to help us in the interpretation aspect of what you see under the microscope. So where are we gonna go to next? We can uh, go look at some of our brood stock. Let's do that. Okay. Where are we now, Connie? Hi everybody, we're um, inside our Carlsbad hatchery in our brood stock area. Um, and so I had to mention that I, some of my responsibilities are the clinical care of our fish, and so I'll talk to you a little bit about fish health and the things that we look for to monitor fish health. So as one of, as the only uh, marine, operating marine hatchery on the West Coast that operates a replenishment program, meaning we raise fish for stock enhancement, so we eventually release them out to the ocean. Um, it's kind of really important to make sure that you not only have good health of your brood stock, but then, because if they're healthy, then they're going to give rise or spawn eggs that hatch and hopefully 
give rise to healthy larvae, which will eventually grow into juvenile fish that we release. And what happens with those fish on the end game, on the end side of things, is that they are caught by fishermen or consumers like you, uh, who will eat them, and we want to make sure that there are no public health concerns. And so that's why my background in veterinary medicine and epidemiology are important to trying to help work with our aquaculture group so that we can manage all of those things. So our, one of the main things you look for when, when with health, with fish health specifically, is water quality. I would say probably 90% at least of your health issues start with poor water quality. Now we source our water from Agua Hedionga Lagoon, which is the natural marine uh, salt water source here that the hatchery is built on or built next to. Um, and so we pull that water in, and the water undergoes ozone treatment, and then UV irradiation to kill any uh, potential pathogens. Prior to going through the ozone and UV, it actually goes through huge sand filters to remove uh, large organic particulates. And so ideally, when, when you send the water through all that process, it has a disinfecting effect because it removes those particulates, um, and it helps slow pathogens if they've made their way into your water system. And ideally you want water that looks fairly clear. There are times when it gets a little more turbid, um, and that happens because potentially your filtration isn't working correctly or you're not backwashing your filters or cleaning them out enough or frequently enough. And I'd say recently, you know, we've been dealing with a pretty heavy red tide event here on the West Coast. Um, the, the red tide uh, dinoflagellate, which is what a, a dinoflagellate is an organism that actually causes the effect of what looks like red tide, um, that has caused a lot of sludge in our water system lately. And so we've had to clean our filters more often and even supply additional oxygen here and there to make sure that broodstock health, and not just broodstock health, but any juveniles we have on site is maintained well. Um, the thing with red tide events are they're not always necessarily a threat to um, fish or marine mammals. It depends on if they produce toxins or not. Um, and in the case of the one that we have here on the West Coast, it is capable of producing a neurotoxin, which could cause problems in animals. But more than likely, um, in the case of our history here on the California coast, the one that is overproducing right now causing this red tide event um, has not been shown to, to produce the serotoxin here in California, at least not on a regular basis. And we haven't noticed any adverse health effects in our fish. And what does that look like? That can look like um, fish swimming erratically or not schooling well in a group, because that's what our white sea bass like to do. Um, they could bob at the surface, look like they're gasping for air, if they're having trouble breathing. Um, you look for different colorations on their scales, or if their scale loss, or if their skin seems infected, meaning like it could be red and discolored. And once the scales pull off or the skin looks infected, that's an area where pathogens can evade and move internally and cause serious problems in the fish. So really, a lot of our job is to maintain really pristine water quality as much as possible, and then to observe because um, this isn't like your regular dog or cat that you might bring into the bed. If we have to get in and handle an individual root stock, it's a big deal. It takes several people to do it safely, and then it really stresses the whole population out. So you have to, to think about the positives and negatives of intervening in the first place. And then from there, if we do diagnose pathogens, then we treat them accordingly. Thank you. It's about uh, we're at our outside free space, um, and so basically what that means is uh, this is kind of the housing unit or area for our juvenile fish in ambient water, which means that the water coming in here goes to sand filtration, but doesn't get any other sterilization effects of the ozone or UV. And the reason for that is to acclimate fish prior to stocking them in offshore net tanks. Um, because in the net pen area, they're going to be exposed to ambient water. 
and older fish that are considered juveniles tend to develop some level of an immune system. And so it's kind of like a prep stage to get them ready to go to open um, neck. Um, so here behind me, you'll see an empty raceway. Usually around this time of year, these are all full. And in fact, they were all full as of a week ago, but uh, due to the, the tide event that we've been having for several weeks now that it's just gotten thicker and thicker over time, um, we started to notice, and, and I had mentioned maintaining effective, clean, pristine water quality, it, it got more difficult to maintain water quality out here despite best efforts of filter changes and cleaning and providing supplemental oxygen, which we always provide to fish out here, but even more so, we were still having oxygen dip, particularly overnight, and that's an effect of the algae sucking that out of the system. So, thankfully to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, they authorized, the pathologist authorized an emergency release to allow us to release those fish to get them into a, a wider open space to allow them to oxygenate properly. And, and so effectively maintaining fish health. So now we're down to having to clean these raceways and get ready for the next set of fish that we'll probably be stocking a few months from now. About a month, is that the next uh, rotation? I don't know, it's usually a few months um, just because of the time of year we're in. So typically it would be a month if we were in cooler temperatures, but this is an ambient water system, so we monitor temperature as well. And when temperatures get to about 18 or 19 degrees centigrade, it, it gets a little harder to maintain health. It's not that it cannot be done, but it depends on a lot of attributes, like density of the fish, uh, and then the temperature, and their, their, feed, their, um, their feed that they consume increases because their metabolism increases in the summer. So ideally, we try to um, stock eggs and raised larvae and juveniles fall through spring. And we try to avoid the really hot summer months where we'll have a harder time regulating temperature outside. Temperature inside the hatchery building is always regulated. So this red tide that's occurring that caused us to release the fish early, is there any prediction how long that will continue? No, uh, we, we usually look to our friends and partner scripts um, to, because they do a lot of that type of research and um, the indications out there is we don't know how long. It could be anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. And I think this is already um, one of the longest occurring red tides, I think in the past 10 or 11 years. I might be off on that statistic, but this one's been occurring, I think as early as early April. So it's been a while, we're now in May. All right, thank you, Connie.